God says, Son, they call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear. We apologize for the heat in here this morning. It's one of those things beyond our control. With a summer like ours, sometimes things just decide that it's not going to work anymore for a while. But we still have to keep on worshiping God, don't we? Amen. Today we want to just divert for a minute from our original theme this summer and look at couple of different subjects for our lesson today or this morning. As you would notice, it's coming from the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's about the parable of the sower. But the subject is, for the nine o'clock hour, is the temporary Christian. As we look at three of our different kinds of souls, we're looking at the temporary Christian. Now, Jesus Christ used parables in order to teach some lessons effectively. And when we look at that word parable, it's an, an interesting word. What is a good definition of this word? Now, a parable, of course, is a moral precept to a familiar situation. It's an outward symbol of an outward or inward reality. It is a lecture. It is an address. It is a figurative discourse or a dark saying in which more is meant that meet the ear into which much or which much valuable though hidden meaning has been closely packed. A parable it's placing one thing beside another with a view to comparison according to vines. It's a story that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. And so we might well ask, what's the purpose? Why did Jesus use parables to teach? There are a few um, reasons we can give. One of them is to reveal truth. Another is to hide the truth or conceal the truth. Another is to embalm the truth. Now, I like that word, embalming the truth. You understand when, you, when someone dies, if you want to keep that body around for a while, you have to embalm the body. So when a truth is told, it must be kept for a while, a long time for that matter. So it has to be enclosed, it has to be wrapped around tightly so that no air gets through. A parable was used to attract attention. Everyone likes to hear a story about familiar situations whether as a farmer, whatever it is, it was, they, they understood then uh, maybe what Christ is about. I know he's talking about farming. I understand farming. But where is he going with this discourse? It also, it, is, it was used to test 
the character of the hearers. Now, oh sorry, all parables, as we have seen, all parables of Christ have to do with the kingdom of God. Now, now let us look at the setting of Matthew 13, the parable of the soil. Let's look at the, the setting. It was springtime by the lake of Galilee, and a crowd of eager listeners were pressing round the great teacher as he sat upon the show. Now, question for you. How would you like to be told that some of you have hard, so hard, that the word of God cannot find a place to enter? So Christ wanted to say this. So how is he best going to teach this lesson? He knew there were reasons, other reasons, why they were following him. It was not all, they didn't always have pure motives. There were some hidden reasons. And so Christ had to teach lessons that will help them to get the message he had in mind. Now so... Sometimes folks listen, but they are so emotional that the word can't find a permanent place. The purpose of a parable was to listen, and, and where Christ is the setting, as we're talking about, to escape the crush, he, he, stopped in, uh, he stepped into a boat which he, which he caused to be pushed a few yards out. And from that novel pulpit, he spoke to the multitudes that lined the beach. Now, according to Mark's account, Mark chapter 4 and verse 3, the very first word of the parable is hearken or listen. And the last words, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, don't you think that is interesting that he, in the first word he says, hey, listen, as if to say, I've got something to tell you, and if you don't pay attention, you're going to miss it. Focus your attention on me for a while. Let, let's see what's coming. Let's see what we can learn from this discourse. I know that you have come because of the bread. I know you have come because, because uh, you're curious. But let's focus for a minute on the message. Now, one might well ask, what, what, what's the significance of these words? What, what, why is he try, what is he trying to get to us? Is it Jesus used a double exclamation introducing the, 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 the sower? He says, behold, this was designed to arrest attention and was to call to ponder carefully that what follows. We're accustomed to traditions. We are accustomed to customs. But when it comes to real learning, sometimes we falter. We are not there. And so we leave a situation worse than it was when we came. So let's focus on what Christ says, behold... He is getting their attention. He wants them to ponder carefully what he is going to say. Hearken indicated that our Lord was about to communicate something of unusual importance. See, the disciples and those to whom Jesus was speaking were bidden to look and learn. Maybe he said, this is an occasion you can't afford to miss. What I'm going to say to you is so important that you can't afford to miss it. 
As if to say, get rid of all the thoughts that are contrary to being here with me. Get rid of all the thoughts that distract you, or that may distract you from hearing the lessons that I intend to teach. Listen. There are some prof um, profound suggestive instructions were about to be given. Brethren, it is well known that the man who teaches has much responsibility. But Jesus is saying here that the man who hears also has responsibility. You see, hearing is a serious matter. And therefore, it is not to be taken lightly. Watch out how you hear is the keynote of the parable. See, this parable is about the soil of human understanding and response. And there were gathered unto him great multitudes. Isn't that what the Bible says? There, that, there was the soil. Now understand this. As we're going to see, there's nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with the sower. But as you're going to see, there was something wrong with the soil. Because all of them had or heard the same word. And the, the seed was sown that everyone could respond to the seed. But not everyone responded alike. So now the question, why did they come? Why were they there that day? Again, we say some came from curiosity. There were idle followers of the crowd. Some came from self-seeking motives. Some came as revolutionaries to make a king, to use him as a flag of revolt. Some came in quick and shallow enthusiasm. But listen, and others in deep longing, and others, they didn't even know why they were there. So as we listen to this this morning, now we have to put ourselves into the picture and ask ourselves the question, why are we here? What kind of soil is our heart? Listen. So we're going to look at these four kinds of grounds this morning. Now look at the text in, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. A sower went forth to sow. You see, we want to look at the soils and the human heart. Now, Jesus' interpretation of the parable hinges on the four kinds of ground. The story takes for granted that the seed sown by the sower is good. So whether or not the seed bears fruit depends on the type of soil into which the seed falls. Now, the four different kinds of grounds then represent four different conditions of the human heart. And notice again, it says, the seed fell. It did what it was supposed to do. As the farmer walked about, he threw the seed and the seed fell. But here comes the lessons. Here comes the first kind of heart. Or saw where the seed fell. He says, look, the wayside are indifferent here. Look at verse 4 of Matthew, 4, of Matthew 13. 
And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 4. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Luke chapter 8 and verse 5, the same thing. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. So some by the wayside, and the birds devoured it. What about this wayside ground? This ground is so hard. Remember what we are talking about. We are not talking about the dirt. We are talking about the human heart. This soil of the human heart is so hard that the seed cannot possibly enter it. See, some people who hear are like this. Now, now you understand why Christ had to use parables because some of the, it had to be hidden. Those who hear it, some who hear it, will not immediately get a grasp what he's saying. And by the time Christ is gone, then they begin to think, he's talking about me. Too late to take up some stones to throw. Now it is sinking in. He is talking about me. Listen, they hear the message of the kingdom, but the message is wasted. Listen, listen. It may be that they, they hear, that as they hear, they allow their minds to wander about in idleness. Or they may hear like the Pharisees with arrogance and pride and turn away in ridicule and scorn. Or they may hear with their eyes on others, always applying the lesson to someone else. And after hearing the message, they go away. And their lives as, are just as they were before they heard. The hard pathway soil represents the individual whose mind is closed. He shuts his eyes and refuses to look. He stops his ears and will not listen. Oh, by the way. The kingdom of heaven is like, is like, and the kingdom of heaven is the church. So the first application has to be, he is talking to the kingdom of heaven, he is talking to the church, that there are listeners just like this in the church. Much more so to the world. Christ is wasting no time. He's letting us know that all of us who sit or who come together will listen. But all of us don't have the same kind of heart. And it is not because the heart is bad because God made it. It is because of our unwillingness to hear and apply what we hear and make it good in our lives. So the hard path we saw represents the individual whose mind is closed. He shuts his ears and refuses to, to look. He stops his is and he will not listen again we have to ask is he talking about me 
So the question now is, is the soul to blame because it is hard? Yes, if the soul is the human heart, it's a sin is what says the conscience and hardens the heart. But sin does not come uninvited. It's a choice that we make. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin. You see, a human heart can be hardened like a pavement by persisting in wrong and rejecting the right. A heart once aglow with love can become insensitive to the needs of others by failing to take advantage of opportunities for doing good. Each refusal to do God's will is like a hundred steps on the human heart. And for this, every individual is accountable. Each man is the cultivator of his own heart. Maybe it's easy to say, well, I didn't like the lesson, I didn't like the teacher, but you are responsible for what you hear. Listen, let's think of this wayside soul for just one more moment. Number one, it's a hard place. It's a hard place. The wayside or indifferent hearer may be a regular listener. Listen. Maybe a regular hearer, but the heart is like a public footpath. Those of us who are old enough remember shortcuts from school to home. And it's a little dirt patch that we walk through every single day and every day we walk on that path it gets harder and harder and the grass begins to die until it becomes so hard that no grass can grow on that path you see the heart is open for the pleasures of sin, which will be hard for the word of God to penetrate. Number two, it's a dangerous place. Why? Because it is exposed to the birds of the air and the feet of every passerby. The word can get in, the seed cannot penetrate. No matter how precious the seed, it can only fall on it. I want to get a picture. The seed can only fall on it. It cannot fall into it. As some would say, it's like water on a duck's back. The seed is always in danger of being lost until it is hid. Psalms 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed is the man that walketh not. In the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Listen. Those of us who watch TV, especially Animal Kingdom, you know that birds or fowls have quick eyes those things can be up there flying and just see a, a let's say a fish out of the water and it can scoop down and get that fish before the fish has time to <laughs> think 
You understand that. But here is the thought. You see, the wicked one detects the precious word lying on the thoughtless heart and he catches it away before you have time to digest the word the devil takes it away listen listen and here is the, the real danger the loss is never felt because it's worth has never been enjoyed. Then this is also a hopeless place. This wayside saw. Here the living seed can find no shelter. Although it may remain for a time, it has no entrance and so can show no life in different hearers can profit nothing. But that's only one kind of soul. Then there's the stony ground or the emotional hearers. Verse number, number five, verses number five and six of Matthew 13. Some upon stony ground. And when they sprang up, the sun scorched them because they had no root. That's dangerous, isn't it? No root. The stony ground is like an emotional hero. <laughs> oh, let's see how we can best. This emotional hero, see, there were many people who followed Jesus impulsively and at times ran over him in order to get to him. What's wrong with them? It, it, it was not that they accepted Jesus too readily for one cannot be too quick in doing what is right and and sometimes listen what th people like me say when we come upon these hearers don't know what they are yet until after the job has been done we ask ourselves where did we go wrong did we baptize this person too soon? How much more teaching should we have done? And we beat ourselves up. But forgetting what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We forget that God has a hand in this. And if a person does not open up to God, regardless of their response, it is not going to be one that is lasting. Because God is not allowed to do his job. Our job is still to teach and baptize the believers. That's our job. We are not police officers. We can't go around trying to be detectives. Finding out who is honest and who is not. No, we teach the word and when someone responds the biblical way, we baptize them. Remember a story that was told many, many years ago. It's not really a story, it's a true fact. When our missionary W. or William Ralph Wharton came to the islands, he set up a Bible correspondence course which he advertised in the local papers. 
And many people responded to that correspondence course. We began to do these lessons. There were 21 lessons. And this he used to get people to study. In, in our country, there are two sides, the Windward and the Leeward. The Leeward is on the Caribbean Sea, the Windward on the Atlantic Ocean. And so the country is divided. He already converted some real good folks on the leeward side. And he says, this is the foundation of the church. Then he came to the windward side and he baptized three young men, all three teachers. And he wrote in the bulletin that he sent out to all of us. These three men, three teachers, are going to be the foundation of the church on this side of the island. Wow. And then he baptized another person whom he called a high school dropout, which he was wrong. We didn't finish school. And didn't put much emphasis on that one. Not too long after the three teachers dropped out, they just wanted to be baptized. He didn't know that. None of us knew that. They just wanted to be baptized. And when that was done, they left. And he was disappointed. We are talking about emotional hearers, about somebody who just wanted to be baptized and was quite frank. And, and that person was really emotional he, the, the, as if they cried that day. It so happened, Brother Walton was wrong. What he called the dropout is still preaching 54 years later. You just never know who it is you're baptizing. Sometimes they are those who will last forever become great teachers and elders and deacons in the church and become great wives and Bible school teachers and they are those who just want to be baptized and that's it. What are we supposed to do? Stop baptizing for? We can't. When we see this parable, we understand better. That our job is to sow the seed of the word of God upon the human heart and people are going to respond in four different ways. Four different ways. Look at this rocky ground. And if you're listening by TV, you got to check in again next week for the rest of this message. We hope you will. The rocky ground... There were many people who followed him impulsively, as we said, and, and in time ran over him to get to him. And we asked what was wrong with them. You see, here's a question. Was it that they were too enthusiastic? But this is or could be the answer. Their trouble was that their faith was shattered. It was thin, like a thin layer of soil over a bed of rock. Have you ever seen rocky soil? There are rocks around, but they are also dirt. And then when you plant a seed, yes, it will spring up, but there is no real place for the root to grow. There are just too many stones, too many rocks. It cannot Hold anything. Listen, listen. And so when persecution came, they give it all up. We have seen this personally too. A mother will come to us and they will talk to us about how wayward their children are. And they want to turn their children over to us. And we work with their children and the mothers are so wonderful. They are so thankful that maybe we can get their children turned around. And then we baptize those children and the mothers start against us. The moment those young people change their lives, 
they turn against us. It doesn't seem reasonable, but that's exactly what happens. Or a husband or a wife. <laughs> we had a case. Can't call the name of the place. Where the husband seemingly was the Christian first. He walked on his wife, he converted her. <laughs> when he did, he stopped coming. She was faithful all of all of us as we know, but he just stopped coming. What happened? You wanted a change, and now we get a change. You quit. When is it ever going to be enough to depend on the word of God? So this stony ground, their faith was outward instead of inward. And this description is true to life. Some people accept the gospel quickly and lay it aside just as quickly. They live on their feelings rather than on convictions. Some people, for example, are so observed in the preacher that when he moves away, they lose their faith. One brother told me in another state, the church was growing, man, it was growing. They had a great number. Then the preacher decided to move to another state. And most of those folks he baptized went back to their denominations. What happened? They came in for the preacher. And when the preacher left, they left with him. No convictions. Some people, yes. They follow after a person. Cities and towns are full of those who accept Jesus before they thought things through. John 1.12 he came to his own. His own received him not, but as many as received him. Listen, to them gave he power to become. Many have received, but did not become because they did not choose to continue the journey. Sometimes the journey is difficult. Sometimes the journey says, I have to disappoint my brother, my, 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 my biological brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers. And some, because you depend upon mama or grandma for a babysitter, you, can't, you have to do what grandma says. So when you change your life and you go on home and tell it to grandma or to mom, and she says, no, you can't go to that church, that's the end of the story. Life is serious business, folks. And becoming a Christian is like that. Many people have found out that it is not easy to be a Christian, although it is easy to start. It is easy to start. Listen. And no matter how much you try, you can only do so much in teaching. The person has a decision to make, choices to make, all by themselves that you can't make for them. But just look at this. Here's what this is all about. According to verse 20 of our text, when the person hears the word of God, they receive it joyfully. There's sometimes tears of gladness. Right? 
But there being no depth of earth, it is easily moved. The shallow-hearted hearer is often very emotional. Their thin layer of feeling is easily wrought upon. Tears are quickly shed and as quickly dried up. They hear the word gladly, but their hearts seem to be in their eyes. And so they are quickly starved. There is no root. It is soon sprang up, but its life was all on the outside. No downward growth because there was no deepness of earth or soil or heart. Beneath the thin um, covering of the emotional feeling, there lies the hard, unyielding rock of stubborn will. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's no room for the root of the matter. And so, they're completely scorched. When the sun comes up, because there's no death, it dries up. There being no inward nourishment, it is soon overcome by outward circumstances. Isn't that what most of us as parents are scared of? If you tell the truth, most of us as parents are scared because our children live by our faith, not theirs. So inwardly, they are dying to get away from us so they don't have to go to church. And when we thought they had a solid foundation, it was just stony. Everything that we taught is just scorched out. They meet somebody who said, hey, you are so pretty. And immediately they fall flat on their backs. I hope you understand. I don't want to be too literal. Because their soil is like stony ground. Unless... The heart, listen, unless the heart is filled with the love of God, the word will not root and grow and stand rooted in love. Persecution soon withers the pretentious. It's amazing. Just listen sometimes to our kids' talk. Just listen. Don't say a word. Don't say a word. All that we taught them, here comes someone along and says, Ah, your parents don't want you to be happy. And they have the nerve to come back and say to us, Well, you don't want us to be happy because I found what happiness is. I just say, Wait. Because nothing without a proper foundation is going to last. I'm sorry. We want the best. We want the best result. But if it does not have the proper soil, it's not going to last. And then we have to pick up the pieces. You hear me? It's not going to last. It may look good for a while. But it's going to fall apart because it was not built on a proper foundation. There is no soundness in the soil. You hear me? And all you could do as a parent is just look and wait and hope for the best. That's all. It's not easy. Listen. Here is a, to me, it's like a paradox. 
What withers the rootless strengthens the rooted. <laughs> it's the same seed. What withers the rootless strengthens the rooted. So the person with the right kind of soul becomes stronger with the same seed that shows that, that the person with the wayside and the stony ground withers from. Let me close this out by looking at one more soul, kind of soul, then we'll be through for the morning. The thorny ground or the double-minded. <laughs> Some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But we have to ask about these thorny ground. You see, this stands for the person who is so busy with other things that he cannot be busy for Christ. Life sometimes gets in the way. Thorns grow up before we know it. It's not planned. It happens. But what are these thorns? Jesus explains them as saying, the cares of the world, the, the, the delight of riches, and the lust for other things. Now this may be summarized simply, as concerns for life on earth. <laughs> what is the normal complaint from wives about their husbands? If you be only if you're married, you know. You are so busy doing other stuff that you don't have time to do what's important in the house. Do I hear? No, I won't ask one amen. You see, that's only true about me. So busy that we forget about the important stuff. You know, sometimes my wife and I get out in the house sometimes, maybe on a Monday or Friday, and we have good lunch, and we are driving home, and we are talking and talking, and I pass the exit heading straight for the church building. And she's looking at me. But knowing her, she's going to say something. Where are you going? And then it hits me. I should be going home, shouldn't I? Am I talking to some other folk here? It seems so quiet this morning. And that's not the heat from the lack of air condition. I hope it is the heat from the words. Listen. Thorns are growing around us and we don't even know it. Now, it is not that earthly things are necessarily bad in themselves. Many, many times they are not. You see, good things can occupy a person's time as well as bad. And more often than not, it is these good things that drain our energies and turn our hearts away from Christ. Listen, listen. A thorn is anything that crowd Jesus out of our lives. A thorn is anything that crowds Jesus out of our lives. Now, if it was necessary that Jesus present a lesson in his day on thorns, how much more so it is today. We stand in danger of being choked to death. 
We are so busy, we do not have time for prayer and study and quietude. And too many of us just have too many irons in the fire at the same time. And something is going to get burned. It never worked and it won't work. You are not that good. Dismissal. Our lives are cumbered by this and that until the good within it is smothered out. No matter how strong we are, we cannot serve two masters, Jesus Christ said in, in Matthew 6, 24. And not even the best of us is able to produce a crop of wheat and a crop of thorns at the same time. And here is what I, I judge myself about on a regular basis. Was I so busy that I did not spend time with my son enough? I'm always judging myself about things. I don't know. But things that are still in my mind. What about you? Sometimes it is true. You see, we expect our children to just follow us without us saying anything. You know that's not good enough. You, a school teacher has to teach. Those kids, what they need to know. And so are we. Or else we are creating some thorny grounds. Sometimes parents say some things you probably don't mean. I don't want to force my child to attend Bible class. Are we afraid the child might learn something? I don't want that teacher teaching my child. What's the problem? You. You become a stumbling block for your own child's development. When a child should be disciplined... I say, that's my child. No one touches my child. That's ignorance. What's a good way to say ignorance? That, what's a good way to say ignorant? Ignant? We understand that word. That's just us being ignorant. Listen. In this soil, and I apologize for going a little bit long, but I, I want to get this lesson out for, for the next part coming in in the, in the next hour. There's plenty soil. There's plenty soil. But the soil is preoccupied. Too many things in its way. So some things are left to grow undisturbed. What we are trying to teach along with what's there, they grow undisturbed. So here's a thought for you. What about your heart? What kind of soul is it? Please don't let it be wayside or stony or thorny. All of this, if it continues, it means a lost soul. A lost soul. But there's a chance. 
That's why Christ said, come unto me, all you that labor, and I have you laden. You have to recognize the fact that your soul is not what it's supposed to be. It is not allowing the word of God to penetrate and find some root and grow and produce in abundance. We have to allow the seed to grow and find good root and grow and strengthen and become useful and produce. Come to Christ because you believe in him. Come to him because you see the need for repentance. Come to him confessing his name and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Come as together we stand and sing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.